Do we still need to create jobs? What are labor unions? And how do they actually work? I'm Dominic Pino, Thomas L. Rhodes Journalism Fellow with the National Review Institute, and we'll look through those questions on this episode of Econception. Econception is a podcast of the American Institute for Economic Research that looks at the economic issues of the day and the broader economic concepts behind them. We're recording today on location from the gap between the number of job openings and the number of unemployed Americans. We currently have 1.5 million more job openings than unemployed people to fill them. Creating jobs, creating jobs, creating jobs. It's all politicians seem to be able to talk about. And obviously jobs are important. We like to have jobs. Employment is good, but... Uh, is creating jobs really the thing that the economy needs right now? Uh, to talk about that question, I have today Scott Lincecum. He is the Vice President of Trade and Economics at the Cato Institute. He's also the author of the Dispatch newsletter, Capitalism. That's capitalism with an O. Get it? It's like the capital, but also capitalism. Uh, it's a great newsletter that he does every week about the economy, and one of his recent dispatches is about this very issue, creating jobs. So uh, thanks so much, Scott, for being here with us. Thanks for having me. All right. So what is about this line from politicians that we always hear, creating jobs? Because uh, I think this is something that is just left over from the Great Recession, when we really did need to create jobs, and now is outdated and how has how has the economy changed since the great recession to make it outdated yeah and i mean i think it is important to note that i mean i've been doing policy since the 90s in some sense and i mean jobs are always going to be a political talking point right there it's classic seen versus unseen i mean you see a job and like you said having a job is important getting you know having good wages and all that that that's certainly important for people's lives so it's always going to be a a political talking point. What happened, though, in the Great Recession is it became the only political talking point, right? That, And that, you know, in one sense is totally understandable. Uh, the Great Recession was incredibly painful for the U.S. labor market. In retrospect, it's very safe to say that we underestimated the extent of the damage that the financial crisis had on the U.S. economy and on the U.S. labor market. Uh, we can argue about maybe the Fed was had the ran policy too tight during that time and all that kind of stuff, right? And And if you look at the data that really threw about 2014-ish, things were pretty bad. Um, wages were stagnant for a or and down from their pre great recession highs uh unemployment was still pretty high at least you know above average it was still difficult to find work for a lot of americans so in that sense perfectly understandable that politicians are going to talk about things like shovel ready jobs and and all that kind of stuff right perfectly understandable now, any economist, even back then, would would most of them will say, "Well, look, uh, we, honestly, jobs are actually a cost. They are not a uh, a goal of especially government spending, uh, right? Uh, if you could build a road tomorrow magically and have it have." absolutely zero jobs involved, no money, no resources, just magically had a super highway across the country. That'd be kind of an amazing thing for the US economy, right? Because those resources would be deployed elsewhere, blah, blah, blah. But again, politically, it was pretty understandable. But the, the issue, and as I wrote in my newsletter last week, the issue is that right around the time that Everybody was jobs obsessed. So again, around 2014, the economy, the U.S. economy, the U.S. labor market, and the U.S. population really started going through a pretty radical shift. One from where the working age population. So I'm not talking about workers. I'm talking about just warm bodies. Uh, after decades of increases, effectively flatlined. 
in the around the middle of the last decade. So when we're talking native born workers, basically just stop growing. And that's a demographic thing, right? We had uh, fewer people having babies and we had a boom, baby, baby boomer generation that was starting to retire or, you know, uh, older people starting to die off, unfortunately. And that created kind of the conditions for a tighter labor market. So a a more limited availability, a more limited pool of available workers than we'd had in previous decades. And so then as the economy started recovering and moving on during the Trump years, that's that simply continued, right? Then and so so you look at things like, you know, uh, job openings and wages and all this other stuff. And things really just started a a pretty steady increase from that from that 2014 nadir. And then the pandemic happened and it supercharged this issue about the actual availability of workers um, because about 2 million or so older workers retired early. So these are not people that are, you know, at what we would call classic retirement age, not in their mid 60s, but they were in their 50s. And that that's so we already had a flatlining native born workforce. And then we subtracted two million more workers right around, of course, the same time we had ultra easy monetary policy because of the pandemic. And of course, a lot of government spending and stuff. So we're fueling demand. So the labor market today is one of we should be really far more worried about the availability of of workers than the availability of jobs. Uh, Because even right now, if you look at the numbers after we're now like 18 months into the Fed's tightening cycle, uh, even with the economy slowing pretty significantly in terms of GDP, uh, job openings are historically elevated way above the levels they were last decade and have been for decades. The prime age employment to population ratio is basically at a record high. That's kind of a a signal for how tight the labor market is and how if we're at full employment, we can say, yeah, we're basically there. And as anybody who you know goes out to eat or or anything else knows, there's still a lot of help wanted signs out there. Talk to anybody who runs a small business in particular, and finding available workers is really really difficult. And so that is, I think, the current moment is one again of labor market tightness and and maybe and really honestly being a, a problem for the economy because. At businesses that can't find workers can't expand, or they and it's a particularly small businesses that have to, you know, have to scrounge. They don't have a a, a, a reputation or whatever. And it's going to be a really difficult thing. And at the same time, it has huge different policy implications, right? Uh, we need to think about things like actually, yes, immigration, uh, or we can think about fertility issues as well. But that's, of course, a that's an 18 year project. That's not a, a tomorrow solution. Productivity becomes more important, right? Trying to get more out of the workers uh, that we do have. So instead of saying things like AI and self driving trucks are a problem, no, that that's actually one of you know that's actually one of one of the solutions we want. Uh, places to do more with fewer workers, we should be encouraging that in terms of regulatory policy and and labor policy and the rest. And we're not doing any of that, at least our national conversation, right? Uh, If you were to turn on the television today uh, and turn into the Republican National Convention or the soon to Democratic National Convention or a stump speech uh, from any campaigning politician, you would you would think it's still 2014. And 2014 was 10 years ago now. I know. And 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 I think that, you know, in, in 2016, 2018, People could be forgiven for still being, you know, I'll, I'll just say jobs obsessed, right? Look, it it takes a while to get all the data. And certainly the pandemic, like I said, kind of supercharged this issue. But like you said, it's now a decade later 
And the narratives, not just from elected officials, I, you know, look, I'm a libertarian. I don't, I don't have much hope for, for most uh, politicians. Uh, but it's also the thing that's really, I think, crazy is that you're still hearing a lot of wonks. Uh, so policy folks, people who should be grappling with the data, talking again like it's 2014, like we should be extremely worried about uh, AI again and self-driving trucks or immigrants taking jobs. Uh, we should be extremely worried um, and we should be trying to create an even tighter labor market. So, you know, uh, deporting a bunch of people and, and doing all sorts of other things. Um, we should be subsidizing jobs. And I mean, it boggles the mind. And I should note that um, things, if you, there, there was a great survey from uh, the Economic Innovation Group uh, just a couple of weeks ago that, that talked to workers and also analyzed wage growth. And you can see in that data in those survey responses and the rest, that the median American worker is in a pretty good spot right now. I mean, obviously there are exceptions. There are certain parts of the labor market, you know, guys without high school degrees. Yeah, that's they that's a that's an issue. But for the median American worker, they've seen now since the 1990s about what is that? We're now at 25, 30 years give or take, of pretty steady wage growth, around 40% after adjusting for inflation. People report having pretty good job security. They report pr being pretty happy with whether they're working full-time or part-time. They are not slaving away at two jobs to make ends meet and all that kind of stuff. And so while certainly we have discrete issues in the labor market, you know, I mentioned one of them, with with the men without high school degrees, certainly we have issues with respect to inflation and high costs and housing and the rest. It's an entirely different playbook from the 2014 playbook, right? I have I would love for politicians to talk about how we can truly lower housing costs, how we can truly lower the cost of basic necessities for the American families. We don't talk about. I mean, still, we don't talk much about that. You know, inflation comes up, oh, Biden inflation and the rest of that kind of stuff. But, but nobody's like, actually, we need to uh, deregulate uh, child care in the states to allow for, you know, uh, staff to child ratios to be liberalized a little bit. Or we need to talk about, of course, housing reform and zoning. And of course, we need to talk about tariffs on construction materials and food and clothing and the rest. We don't Never, especially from, again, the pro-worker caucus, I'll call them. It's all wages, 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 keep protectionism, nativism, tight labor markets, wage subsidies, all that kind of stuff. And and you know, you're sitting there going like, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? We have a tight labor market. Yeah. Uh, I, remember, I remember the um, 2018, 2019, uh, when the Trump administration would brag about their economic policy, they would, every once in a while, they would say, we have more jobs and people to fill them. And they would say that, and, and look, that's great uh, in one sense, right? I mean, because that means that we're no longer in that great recession recovery period, which was genuinely really, really bad. So, 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 so the final, you know, finally getting out of that is, is a good thing. But then they'd follow it up by saying how many, how their policies are creating jobs. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you just said that we have more jobs and people to fill them. So we clearly don't need to create more. What we need is more, more workers. And, you know, one of the things, you know, obviously that, that brings up immigration like instantly as a, as a, as a possible solution. And certainly that's part of the story, but there's a lot of things we can do too, to get more Americans working. I know uh, you guys at Cato did a policy book uh, last year about, about, uh, about workers. And, you know, I can think of a couple different things. You know, you talked one about early retirements during COVID. So we have sort of workers on the, on the older end of the age spectrum who are leaving the workforce early on the younger end of the age spectrum too. you know, extremely high minimum wages in a lot of cities and some States basically locks teenagers out of the labor market because right. they 
you know, if there's a minimum wage of 12 or $15 an hour, teenagers just aren't, aren't productive enough to merit that, but you know, they probably would be able to be hired for eight or 10. And so that's, that's another thing that's, that's reducing our, our labor supply. And, and one of the things that you guys talk about in that report that I think is under discussed relative to a lot of these other issues is the criminal justice system. Yeah, for sure. And how we have, you know, when we, you know, you mentioned men without high school, uh, diplomas, one of the biggest things holding them back is not trade. It's not any of these other things that we like to talk about. It's the fact that a lot of them have criminal records and a lot of them are for stuff that, quite frankly, yeah. probably shouldn't be a, a criminal record or it, it shouldn't be something that's holding them back from getting a job. Or stuff and that so, isn't even a crime today, you know, in a lot of states that have legalized marijuana, right? You know, a lot of young guys and women have uh, drug convictions from from when they were 18 or whatever, and that's holding them out of the labor market. Yeah, I, I think criminal justice reform uh, and uh, the effect of a criminal record on labor market participation is wildly under discussed because it's it's astonishing how many how many Americans have a criminal record, right? How, how, how oh, big it's is millions, it? tens of millions, in fact. Yeah. And the numbers are mind boggling. And a lot of it, but not all of it, is drug related. And certainly, let's face it. A lot of the people with criminal records are are not, you know, going to be great members of society, right? I mean, look, there's violent crime and that kind of stuff. That's that's a true problem. But there are there are states that are experimenting with distinguishing between those things, right? If you are were arrested for a nonviolent offense. 10 years ago, well, hey, maybe you should automatically get your record expunged, right? I mean, you haven't done anything for 10 years. You've never hurt anybody. You were an idiot kid like we all were. And, um, you know, and that, that record's holding you back. And believe it or not, it's not just a problem for young men. It's a problem for young women too. Some research shows that they're far more stigmatized by a criminal record. So you have young women suffering as well. And so we never talk about that stuff, which we should, again, when we're talking about trying to boost labor supply. We also don't talk a lot. I mean, some conservatives do, but a lot of kind of the, again, pro-worker caucus don't is uh, disability and other forms of welfare. Not merely keeping people, you know, subsidizing their existence without work. That's, of course, one issue. But the other issue is locking people in place. We don't talk about that at all because, you know, a lot of welfare is distributed at the state and local level, even though it's a federal program. And what happens? Well, you you hear people who say, yeah, I live in certain town in Ohio, but if I moved to Indiana for a job, I'd lose all of my benefits and I'd lose my Section 8 housing voucher or whatever. And so I'm going to stay here, even though the the where they live is 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 not a healthy or thriving place, right? So we don't talk about that at all, and and we don't talk about. I mean, education is another area. You know, in some ways, fortunately, education policy has survived our kind of populist moment. Uh, you know, their school choice has been the the movement there has been great, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of other stuff about you know technical and vocational training i just read a great article about schools in pittsburgh are really working on uh targeting kids in high school that are pretty smart but maybe not they don't want to go to college or at least giving them the option of going into skilled trades or stuff like that and and so those are those are all good options too <laughs> that that we don't discuss at all you know preparing the kids of today for the economy of tomorrow instead of preparing them for the economy of yesterday, right? Well, and even in the economy of yesterday, you still had to know how to read. And yeah, we've got sure. we've got just atrocious results in schools where you've got, especially in big cities where, you know, which, hey, big cities are big for a reason. It's where most people live. <laughs> These right. are places where, where you have entire schools sometimes where not a single student is reading at grade level, Correct. is proficient in math. And then we sit around and wonder why it's hard to find jobs. It's, well, <laughs> I mean, I, this, this seems like a, this seems like a, a pretty uh, major area to pick on. And yeah, so, like I said, we mentioned immigration before. There, obviously, there has been an increase in immigration in the last uh, few years. A lot of it not legal, correct? Uh, so that's a problem in terms of you know following the law. But how much of that 
how much of that increase do you think is a demand pull from the fact that we have uh, more jobs and people to fill them right now? Yeah. I mean, it's a classic example of the pull factor. So, right. So for people listening, right, there's push and pull factors for immigration. The push is, you know, people seeking asylum or, um, you know, just trying to leave bad places. And, and that's obviously motivating some, uh, a good chunk of, of what's going on uh, with immigration right now. But the other side uh, is the pull factors. When you have a strong U.S. economy, uh, when you have a very tight U.S. labor market, that that's a magnet for people who are, you know, living in, in dire straits in, in uh, countries that aren't so great. And uh, there was a great report from, I believe it was the Dallas Fed. I cited it in my newsletter that looked at those pull factors and said, right now, the pull factors are probably dominating the push factors. Because if you actually look at what they did, they, it's very clever. They looked at wage growth in immigrant heavy industries. So like, construction or whatever. And they actually found that wage growth in those industries was exceeding national wage growth, right? So this was not uh, an issue of uh, immigrants kind of just flooding into construction and depressing wages. In fact, no, they were likely being drawn to those sectors because those sectors were so desperate for bodies, right? So so th- that was a pretty good sign. You know, we, it's always impossible to know for 100% sure, but it, pretty good shot sign that our current labor market situation is 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 a draw and of course we at Cato would love to have a more liberalized legal immigration process and we've repeatedly warned that if you don't have a more liberalized legal immigration process you're going to have more illegal immigration for a lot of those poll reasons so it again you know whether we like it or not uh, immigration policy with respect to labor market policy becomes a, a a big issue going forward. And it's just, a, and it's an economic issue more broadly. I mean, you know, if you, I don't think people quite grasp that, you know, the, the availability of workers and the availability of people, so having people is important for economic growth and for productivity and for innovation and all those things. You know, immigrants start a lot of businesses. Native born entrepreneurs need workers too, we, you know, as we talked about. So there's a really strong connection between uh, population growth and all of those things that we love for to have a better economy uh, and to have more growth. And so when you artificially restrict those things, and when you intentionally depress uh, population and labor supply, like some people are still advocating, you're going to end up with just a slower and more stagnant U.S. economy. Now, it's not you know, it's not doom, at least not in the near term, right? But it just means a little less growth, a little less prosperity, a little less innovation. And quite frankly, that other countries, you know, like Canada or uh, elsewhere are going to get those benefits that we're, that we're just simply discarding. You know, one of America's superpowers I've said and others say is our ability to track the best and brightest and smartest and hardest working people from all over the world and then to turn them into billionaires, right? Uh, or at the very least, just successful small business people, right? Uh, and to uh, leave that $100 bill on the sidewalk is, a, I think, a big mistake. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, there might have been a case back before 2014 uh, that you could have said immigrants are going to replace Americans in the job market, but that's just not the case yeah, anymore. And, we and again, I for anybody who's shaking their head, who's gotten this far and is, thinks I'm full of it, I really do. I highly recommend just checking out some of the charts that we put together for my column showing native born population and labor force, right? And it is, I mean, it's a startling change. It was, it was going up, going up, going up and through, you know, the mid two thousands. And then it just stopped, right? I mean, it just flatlined. And so either we're going to, you know, it's get busy living or get busy dying. Right. And, and I would prefer the former. All right. Well, thanks so much, Scott, for talking about this. Uh, his uh, newsletter for The Dispatch called Capitalism comes out every week. Uh, definitely check it out and uh, check out all the stuff that he's doing at Cato as well. So uh, thanks, Scott. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. 
I usually cover two different current events topics in the second half of the show, uh, but today I'm going to spend some more time just on one of them, which is labor unions. Uh, the speech by Sean O'Brien, the president of the Teamsters Union at the Republican National Convention last week, uh, sort of put this issue back in the forefront of people's minds. And I think there's a lot of confusion and a lot of forgetfulness, quite frankly, about how unions have actually worked in the United States. Because unions sound like a good idea. You would have groups of workers coming together to advocate for higher pay, better benefits, safer working conditions, etc. And this makes people feel good. Because they like to imagine that it's helping other people. We see evidence of this in opinion polling. You might have seen a headline at some point in the last couple of years about how Americans' opinions of labor unions are at record highs. This is based on a poll that Gallup does, and they've asked this question over many years. And it is true that... When they ask, what is your opinion of labor unions, about two-thirds of Americans now say they have a positive opinion, which is uh, a record high in that survey. And that goes back a few decades. So that's, that's something. It's not, it's not nothing. But the exact same survey asks respondents, would you personally be interested in joining a labor union? And notice how notice the slight difference in the question there, right? This is taking the first question is, do you have a positive opinion of labor unions as an abstract concept? The second question is, would you personally like to join one? And the exact same people that say they have a positive opinion of unions in general also told Gallup, a supermajority told Gallup, that they are not interested in joining a union themselves. Only 11% of the people surveyed said that they were very interested in joining a union. And that just about perfectly matches the actual unionization rate in the United States, which is 10%. Now, if we look at that 10%, about half of union members in the United States work for government. Half work for government. So these are not the downtrodden working class. These are not the blue-collar workers on a construction site. These are government bureaucrats. So that's half of union members in the United States. It's government bureaucrats, it's teachers, it's firefighters, it's policemen, it's all that kind of stuff. Most of them are paid pretty well. And even the ones that are paid okay, like teachers, have extremely generous benefits packages. And so while they might have slightly lower wages than you might think, they have very good health coverage and very good retirement plans. And a public sector union is really a different thing than a private sector union, because a public sector union is bargaining against the taxpayer. On paper, they're bargaining against the government, because the government is management, and they are the employees. So on paper, they are bargaining against politicians, but in many cases, labor unions helped elect the politicians that they're bargaining against. So that's not really bargaining. That's really a payoff. It's them saying, we just helped you get elected. Now it's time for us to get what's ours. And that's what we see, especially in Democrat-run states, because all of these unions basically across the board support Democrats and basically never support Republicans. And so they help Democrats get elected. Democrats give them what they want in contract negotiations. And the taxpayer just has to pay for this, because unlike in the private sector where competition between companies sort of sets an upper limit on how much companies could pay. And companies' profitability sort of sets an upper limit on how much they could pay because if they paid more, they'd go out of business and everyone would lose their jobs. But government can't go out of business. So the unions can just ask for however much they want. And as long as the politician who is elected supports the union, they're probably going to get it. So again, that's a public sector union. That's a different thing. That leads to these huge funding problems in many state and local governments where there's just simply no possible way they're going to be able to pay the pension benefits that they've promised 
We talked about that problem on a previous episode of Econception with Tom Savage. I encourage you to go back and check that out, learn more about that issue. But now let's turn to the other half of union members in the U.S. who are members of private sector unions. Now, in the private sector, the unionization rate for all private sector workers is only 6%, and that's a record low. Bureau of Labor Statistics has kept track of that since about 1980. But we have other data going back to about the uh, end of World War II, and that's when the unionization rate in the U.S. was the highest. And that came after the National Labor Relations Act, or the Wagner Act, same, it's the same, two names for the same law. They were passed, it was passed, I should say, in 1935 as part of the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt and Democrats. And this was a political play, more than anything, by Democrats, who saw the opportunity to grow their political movement. It was successful for them for a while. Labor unions became extremely powerful because the National Labor Relations Act puts the federal government on the side of unions. Joe Biden says this all the time, if you listen to him speak, by the way. And he's right about that. That is exactly what the National Labor Relations Act does. It says that the federal government should side with unions, it should encourage unionization, and it should seek to make it easier for workers to join unions. Now, as you can see, it hasn't really worked because the unionization rate in the aftermath of World War II and in the early 1950s was about a third, about, about 30, 30, 35% of U.S. workers were in a union. And like I said, today it's, it's 10%. And in the private sector, it's only 6%. And I should say, at that time, there were no public sector unions. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt himself was personally opposed to public sector unions. He thought they were very, very good to have in the private sector, and he did everything he could to encourage them in the private sector, but he opposed them in the public sector, and that problem didn't really start until the 1960s. But private sector unions had their heyday right after World War II. Between 2 and 4 million Americans went on strike at some point in 1946. There was chaos in the economy. Harry Truman, who was president at the time, was in a really tough spot. And this chaos, unleashed by labor unions, gave Republicans their first congressional majority in about two decades, in 1946, in the midterm elections. So Republicans came in, and then in 1947, they passed the Taft-Hartley Act. Taft-Hartley Act does a couple of different things. One, it bans a lot of the most destructive uh Union practices. So it says you can't go on strike uh, in sympathy with another union. You can only go on strike against the employer that you bargain with, and you have to do it for a reason. You can't do it for a political reason. It has to be a reason related to your contract negotiations. It has to be related to pay, related to benefits, working conditions. It has to be related to something that a union is actually supposed to do. So that prevents the Massive economy-wide strikes where one union strikes against an, a, their employer for a legitimate reason, and then a bunch of other unions just team up in solidarity with that union, even though they have nothing to do with the actual dispute. It also bans jurisdictional strikes, which are strikes where unions strike against other unions over who gets to do certain jobs. It says you can't do that. It has to be against your employer. And so this law has saved the U.S. economy a lot of trouble since it's been passed. It avoids things like we've seen in years after that in the United Kingdom, for example, in the 1970s, where you had massive economy-wide disruptions because of labor union power. The Taft-Hartley Act also allowed states to pass right-to-work laws. That just makes sure that union membership is voluntary. And 26 states currently have right-to-work laws in effect. So this has been popular, and this was a Republican response to Democrats' uh, laws on this. It still doesn't change the fact that the federal government is very much on the side of unions as a matter of law. They just make it a little bit harder for them to do some of the most destructive things that they are capable of doing. And it's generally been successful on that. And so as more workers have had the freedom to 
choose whether they want to be in a union or not. Many have chosen not. And so that's why we've seen this decline over a long period of time. Another reason we've seen this decline is that unions have just proven themselves in the United States to be unworthy of workers' trust. The Teamsters were at one point the largest labor union in the United States. 1970s, they had about two, two and a half million members. And they were incredibly corrupt. They did everything they could to limit competition and the supply of trucking services in order to keep the wages for their members high, which I guess was nice for the members, except that they were also often embezzling money from their members, (laughs) stealing from their members' pension benefits, and doing so in coordination with organized crime. Unions get their power from limiting the supply of jobs. This is why the whole idea that unions are always pro-worker doesn't really make much sense. One of the most effective unions on this regard has been the elevator union. There was a really good report from the uh, Center for Building in North America that came out a couple weeks ago that was about how Installing an elevator in the United States costs about three times as much as it costs basically anywhere else in the world. Part of this is government regulations, and part of it is the elevator union. Elevator repairmen are paid more than any other construction trade, and it's because the elevator union in the United States has a master contract with all of the major elevator manufacturers that sets their wages very high. It gives them control over who is allowed to be an elevator repairman. And so they keep the supply of labor low so that the price of labor, the wages, are very, very high. Now, that's good for the elevator repairman, for sure. And if you're fortunate enough to be on the right side of the elevator repair union, and you get that job, good for you. But this is a case of the seen and the unseen. When economists talk about the total effect, what you see is highly paid elevator repair people. What you don't see are all the other people who didn't get hired because the elevator repair people are being paid above a market wage. That shows up in two different ways. The first way, as I mentioned before, is that the elevator repair union restricts entry into that labor market. They do so, they control the apprenticeship programs that allow you to get certified. And in many cases, there are government licensing requirements that go with it as well. And so there's barriers to entry to that. And so a lot of people who might want to be elevator repairmen aren't allowed to be because if they were allowed to be, It would increase the supply of labor too much and and the price would come down. So that's the first way it shows up. The second way it shows up is from the builder, the building contractor's point of view. If you're building, let's say, an apartment building and you are installing an elevator, you only have so much money that you can put into that project. So all the extra above market wages that you have to pay to the elevator people is money that you can't pay to bricklayers or to welders or whoever else might be needed to work on that project. And so here, what the union is doing is it's just acting to move money around. It's not making everybody better off. It's making their members better off at the expense of other people. And that's really the union mindset. It's that the labor market is zero sum. It's that what's good for me is bad for someone else. And so I have to make sure that I'm getting what's good for me so that I'm not on the losing end of this. And so it sets up this very confrontational system. And that's where you get a lot of this influence from organized crime, for example. Because what happens a lot of times, especially in construction trades, especially in big cities, and less so now, but that's just because law enforcement has gotten better at fighting the mafia. But how it used to work was uh, a union boss would go to a contractor and they would say, well, you can hire our workers at this above market rate 
Or if you don't want to do that and you want to hire non-union workers, that's fine, but you just have to pay me a kickback. And that's illegal. So that's why unions would enlist organized crime in order to collect that money and enforce that kind of illegal contract. And so that's where you get the stories about mobsters going and breaking people's knees and that kind of stuff. Again, it's all based on this idea that the labor market is zero sum and I have to get what's mine so that you don't take it instead. This is the complete opposite of how a free society should work. In a true free labor market, people are paid according to productivity. If people are paid according to productivity, the way to raise pay is to raise productivity. You can go back and listen to the episode with Scott Winship where we talk about this exact issue and how actually the historical data show pretty clearly that in the United States, productivity and pay are linked pretty strongly. That's great news. Because if workers become more productive, they can all get paid more. And they're all getting paid more in a way that's not inflationary because they're not getting paid more for the same amount of output. They're getting paid more for more output. More output is better for them because it means that their pay rate is actually sustainable. They don't need a labor union or mob bosses to enforce their labor contracts because they're actually getting paid what they earn. And it's better for consumers because now there's more output and that helps prices to come down. It helps to provide more choices. It helps to provide better products. And again, that's really what we have seen in the United States. So it makes perfect sense then that a lot of workers have said, you know what? I don't really want to be part of an organization that is going to take dues from me so that I'm paid a little bit less than I otherwise would be, steal some of it, donate some of it to politicians, take some of it for exorbitant wages for union bosses. And really not do very much to represent me at all, because they're more interested in political power and giving speeches at political conventions than they are in representing my interests in the workplace. Now it's time for the paper of the episode, but before that, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a positive review wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us to know you enjoy the show and makes the show more visible for others to start listening as well. I let Scott pick the paper of the episode from the National Bureau of Economic Research in November 2022 by Lisa Kahn, Lindsay Oldensky, and Gunyan Park, Racial and Ethnic Inequality and the China Shock. Here's Scott to tell you about it. Well, I wouldn't wouldn't call it my favorite economics paper of all time, but I think it's one that is pretty great and uh, totally under-discussed or not discussed at all. Uh, and it's, uh, it's got a horrible for title, actually, uh, Racial and Ethnic Inequality and the China Shock. Uh, maybe that's why nobody read it. But uh, essentially what these economists did was they went back to the China Shock literature. Uh, for those who don't know, the China Shock is a very – over discussed, I think, set of economics papers that showed that a pretty substantial increase in Chinese imports during the 2000s mainly uh, destroyed uh, or displaced about 2 million American workers, about a million in manufacturing. And that has become probably the main talking point for current American protectionism, right? Millions of jobs lost due to China. Uh, it's also a big point in the whole geopolitical issue between US and China. I've written for uh, now years about how the general narrative about the China shock literature itself is is wrong. But what I really, really like about this paper is they actually went back and looked at what happened with the China shock for v- different demographic groups. So not just glomming together all workers as kind of one unit, right? But instead saying, okay, let's look at what happened to white workers. Let's look what happened to black workers. Let's look what happened to Hispanic workers and see if maybe uh, they were affected differently. Because I think one of the big one of the big points about the China shock and one of the mistakes they make is it just assumes that there's this big lump of worker, 
right? It's one, one, it looks like one person, probably a middle-aged dude in the Midwest and, uh, and that's it. And, and he lost his job and that's it. So instead they break it down by ethnicity and the results are pretty, pretty fascinating. What they find is that the China shock had really different effects for those three different groups. For uh, Hispanic workers, uh, the China shock was pretty devastating at first because they were working in mainly low or in a lot of workers were in low wage manufacturing, which is where the big brunt of the China shock hit textiles and furniture and the rest. So, but after about five years, they found that they recovered and they were doing better after, you know, uh, a decade or so than they were uh, pre China shock. So that's, that's a pretty good story because the China shock is again, mainly about, uh, not about trade, really. It's about adjustment and about how workers didn't adjust. So here for Hispanics, workers did adjust. So then they look at black workers and they find that black workers actually weren't really harmed that much at all, even in the, in the short to medium term, uh, partly because they weren't heavily working in manufacturing. But the other reason is that even in manufacturing, even in the same types of jobs that other, you know, white or Hispanic workers were working, they just simply moved on. They lost their jobs. They, that sucked, of course. And then, but what they do, they moved into services and they, so they got other jobs and they, and they moved on with their lives. And they actually, again, were much better off in the long term due to uh, that change in, in career, but also due to the kind of cons- pro consumer effects of the China shock as well. So black workers doing great. And then they looked at white workers and they found that white workers were the ones that, that did suffer. And they suffered, again, not because of the initial displacement of the China shock, but just simply because they didn't adjust. And again, I'm, I'm painting in broad brush, right? But they show that for some reason, and they don't put up, they don't, they don't dig into that. For some reason, wor- white workers in the exact same positions as the black and Hispanic workers uh, in manufacturing that were affected by the China shock uh, just never adjusted, or at least not in the, in, you know, in the medium to long term. And that's a, I think, pretty fascinating result. And they do have some guesses as to why it happened, right? They said, well, a welfare policy could be, you know, that that white workers saw the availability of social security disability or other things, and just simply that's that's what they chose to do. Whereas black and Hispanic workers either didn't know about it or just chose to they chose a different path. But they also said, you know, it it could be cultural that that they saw a stigma in services work, right? You know, services are routinely stigmatized, even though they they can often pay better than manufacturing. And so they just saw that as either beneath them or whatever. But the the bottom line is that I I love this paper because it really shows that it is that first, the American worker is not a monolith. It is not a single person. Uh, But second, that the China shot story is an adjustment story and that a lot of workers uh, did move on with their lives when bad stuff happened. Because, of course, disruption happens not just from China's or, or, or trade, but from technology and changing consumer tastes and interstate competition and the rest. Uh, that's, you know, the price of admission to a dynamic economy is that type of disruption. Uh, and, and so there is this, uh, there was an adjustment problem. And it would be great if we, as wonks, looked more at what is thwarting the adjustment, right? Not simply obsessing about the disruption, but saying, why didn't white workers move on, right? In this case, right? Why did black workers move on? And what can we learn from that regarding policy? You know, again, maybe welfare policy is a, a, an area we need to really look at regarding to adjustment. But there's also, of course, a million other things, right? Maybe it's housing policy or state and local tax policy. Who knows, right? Uh, but but that's uh, where we should be focusing instead of just, again, obsessing about the, the disruption itself. Racial and Ethnic Inequality and the China Shock by Khan, Oldensky, and Park. Read it. That's all for today. Remember, the economy is complicated and nobody has all the answers, but markets work. <laughs>